Bhagavad Gita, verse 2.40 Endeavors on the path of Bhakti Yoga are not fruitless, nor do they contain any flaw. Even a little practice frees one from the great danger of transmigrating endlessly within the cycle of repeated birth and death in this material world. Sar Ardhavashini O Arjuna, Yoga, Buddhi Yoga, is of two types. First, Bhakti Yoga, in the form of hearing and chanting. And second, Bhagavat Arpita Nishkama Karma Yoga, which entails surrendering the fruit of one's selfless action to Sri Bhagavan. In the Gita 2.47, Sri Krishna says, O Arjuna, you have the qualification to perform action, karma, only. Now, before karma yoga is described, bhakti yoga is being delineated. The Gita 2.45 states, O Arjuna, situate yourself beyond the three modes of material nature. This statement certainly means that bhakti is beyond the three modes, because it is only by bhakti that a person can transcend the modes of nature. This is well known from the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Jnana and karma are described as being in the modes of goodness and passion respectively, which proves that they are not beyond the three modes of nature. Bhagavat Arpita Nishkama Karma Yoga is bhakti that is characterized by offering the fruits of one's karma action to Sri Bhagavan. It does not allow the karma to go in vain, as is the case with the performance of described duty that is not offered to Bhagavan. However, because devotion is not predominant in such activities, they are not accepted as actual bhakti. If prescribed duty, karma, in which the fruits are offered to Sri Bhagavan were accepted as bhakti, then what would constitute karma? If one says that karma is only action that is not offered to Sri Bhagavan, that is not correct. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.5.12 states, that one of the characteristics of Brahma, the effulgence of Sri Bhagavan, is that it is inactive, niche karma. Being identical with the mode of inactivity, it is called naish karmya. Knowledge of Brahma is without any material motivation and faultless. But even that is not praiseworthy because it is devoid of bhakti. How then can action that is performed with personal desire, sakama karma, and selfless action, nishkama karma, be praiseworthy, even they are not offered to Bhagavan, since they are troublesome in both the stages of practice and the final attainment? According to the above-mentioned statement spoken by Sri Narada, Srimad Bhagavatam 1.5.12, karma that is not offered to Sri Bhagavan is useless. Therefore, only that bhakti which is characterized by hearing and chanting has been accepted as the practice to attain the sweetness of the lotus feet of Sri Bhagavan. Nevertheless, selfless action that is offered to Sri Bhagavan or Nishkama Karma Yoga is also worthy of consideration. Both types of yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Nishkama Karma Yoga, are to be understood by the word Buddhi Yoga. This is evident from the statements of Bhagavad Gita, such as, I bestow upon them that buddhi yoga by which they can attain me gita 10.10 10. 
and O Dhananjaya compared to Bodhi Yoga, action with fruitive desire, Sakama Karma, is very insignificant. Gita 2.49 Now, this verse beginning with Neha explains the glory of devotion to Bhagavan that is free from the modes of material nature, Nirguna Bhakti, which is characterized by hearing and chanting. Sri Bhagavan says, The benefit that comes from practicing even the initial steps of Bhakti Yoga can never be destroyed, and thus it does not have the fault of becoming lost. Conversely, if a person starts to perform karma yoga but does not complete it, the result of whatever karma he has performed is lost and fault is incurred. The question may be raised, can the result of bhakti be attained by those who desire to follow the process but are unable to perform it properly? Sri Krishna responds with svalpam, which means that even if their practice of bhakti has only just begun, the result is never lost and one will be delivered from this material world. The life histories of Ajamila and others are evident of this. Srimad Bhagavatam 6.16.44 also states that just by once hearing Sri Bhagavan's name, even a low-class dog-eater is freed from the great fear caused by material existence. Moreover, in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.29.20, it is stated, O Uddhava, because I have personally determined the transcendental nature of this dharma, even if one improperly performs selfless action performed for pure bhakti in the form of hearing and chanting, there is no possibility of the slightest loss. The purport of this statements of Srimad Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam seems to be the same, but the above statement of Bhagavatam has a special characteristic. If an object is transcendental, it is never destroyed. This is the only point worthy of deliberation in this context. One may argue that selfless action offered to Sri Bhagavan can also become transcendental to the modes of nature by his grace. But this is not a fact. Srimad Bhagavatam 11.25.23 gives evidence of this. Obligatory and occasional duties, nitya and naimitika karma, that are performed without any fruitive desire and offered to me are considered to be in the mode of goodness. In other words, they are not transcendental to the three modes of material nature. Sar Ardhavarshini Prakashikariti Here, Buddha Yoga is described as being of two types. The first is Bhakti Yoga in the form of hearing and chanting, and the second is Nishkama Karma Yoga, wherein the results of karma are offered to Sri Bhagavan without motive. Of these two, the first is primary Bhakti Yoga, and the second is secondary Bhakti Yoga. In fact, Bhakti Yoga is completely transcendental to the modes of nature, no irregularities, faults or unwanted reactions can occur in the beginning of one's practice nor in the course of one's practice, even if for some reason one is unable to complete it. Rather, a little performance of Bhakti Yoga delivers the practitioner from the terrible dangers of the material world and makes his life successful by giving him service to Sri Bhagavan. 
The following example can be cited. Because Bharata Maharaja became attached to a deer, he was not able to complete the full process of bhakti. Although in his next birth he took the body of a deer, the influence of his previous life's performance of bhakti enabled him to associate with pure devotees of Bhagavan. Taking birth again, he became the highest class of devotee, an Uttama Bhagavata, and performed service to Sri Bhagavan. Therefore, Bhagavan says in the Gita 6.40, a person who has fallen from the path of Bhakti is never lost in this world or in the next, nor does he ever obtain a miserable condition. On the other hand, in Bhagavad's Arpita Nishkamakarma Yoga, wherein the fruits of one's action are offered to Bhagavan, is still referred to as Karma Yoga, not Bhakti Yoga. By first performing Karma Yoga, the heart becomes purified, and eventually one attains Bhakti Yoga. Therefore, this Karma Yoga only aims at Bhakti indirectly, from far away. Unlike pure Bhakti, Karma Yoga is not transcendental, nor is it free from material contamination. Rather, it is called Karma in the mode of goodness. Moreover, if a person does not perform this karma perfectly, or if he does not complete his practice, it may become lust and he will incur some unwanted results. However, as stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.25.23, if a practitioner of bhakti begins to perform this bhakti yoga even slightly, but leaves the path due to his own incapability or if his practices cease due to his sudden, untimely death while he is in either the beginning or intermediate stage, his endeavors in bhakti will never go in vain. In other words, his endeavors do not become faulty, nor does he incur any sin even if he is unable to complete the process. In his next life, the practitioner will continue from that same point from where his performance of Bhakti Yoga was obstructed. The presiding deity of Bhakti Yoga, Sri Krishna, or Bhakti Devi herself, makes all these arrangements. In this context, there is one important point to note. If a practitioner has faith, but due to ignorance, there are some irregularities in his performance, the results of Bhakti Yoga will never be lost, nor does he incur sin. However, if someone offends the spiritual master, the Vaishnavas, or anything that belongs to Sri Bhagavan, or is related to him, such as Tulasi, Yamuna or the Holy Dham, that person's Bhakti Yoga can be completely ruined.